This is part three of the Advanced Squad Tactics series. If you missed parts one or two, go ahead and click either of the links below. Hello, and welcome back to Dr. Iceblade's channel. In part three of Advanced Squad Tactics, we're actually going to kind of go into a little bit of in-depth analysis on the squad composition we chose for this mission itself, as well as kind of review some of the other possible combinations that you can use. Now, as I had mentioned in the previous videos, I always recommend using at least two Grenadiers. The reason for this being, again, the AI takes very good tactical advantage of cover and having the option to blow it up and using these guys basically to blast through heavy armor mechanized units becomes increasingly more important as you progress through the game. Additionally, you'll probably find, at least from early to mid game, that running two rangers tends to be very fortuitous, mostly because it's always nice to have one phantom ranger that you can scout ahead, discover pods, not putting yourself into some sticky situations by not knowing what's ahead and one Sword Ranger who can tend to basically finish off those guys that are a little bit low and or deal with some of the melee units you'll encounter throughout the game. It tends to be pretty handy, but this is again, I'll kind of cover the whole how many Rangers you need to bring in a little bit, because really, when you get to the size soldiers, you only need one, and there's kind of a unique way to spec them. Obviously, you'll always need one Specialist to provide heals and hacking. Anytime you actually encounter a terminal, of course, where you can hack and get a bonus to it, you definitely want to have this guy along. And I'll kind of go over the unique spec that I made for him so that I can have him basically act as two specialists, providing both heals and hacking special ability that you'll need as well. And then, of course, in your last position, you can rock a sharpshooter. You can even swap this guy. You can do the same composition and swap out the sharpshooter for a size soldier. I don't really recommend it. These guys are pretty heavy hitters. And if you spec them properly, they'll be able to deal with both close and long-range encounters very well, adding a very good utilitarian complement to your squad. So again, I mentioned earlier, two Grenadiers tends to be very key, and it's also because I spec them slightly differently so that they can make adva take advantage of, you know, how I actually engage in squad tactics throughout. So on both of my Grenadiers, I pretty much always get Shredder and Suppression because their equivalents on the other side tend to be kind of mediocre at best. Blast padding does make you more survivable. Enemies rarely use grenades, and typically speaking, when you're launching them yourself, you're not doing it on top of yourself. Demolition, again, has a chance to destroy cover. You'll find that just launching grenades does just as good a job of that, and then when you get saturation fire or a couple other skills on the heavy armor, this just becomes kind of non-necessary. Whereas a minus 50 aim penalty on those sticky situations, before you get a size soldier that can stasis somebody, to basically put somebody technically out of commission, assuming you don't miss and they move, is also very handy. And then here is where the two Grenadiers diverge. On this one, I get Holo Targeting, Volatile Mix, Hail of Bullets, and then Saturation Fire. And on the other Grenadier, I swap most of those abilities, except for, of course, Saturation Fire, so that you get Heavy Ordnance for an extra grenade in your grenade-only slot. Since I'm not getting Volatile Mix, this kind of counterbalances that, which is nice chain shot, so they have a single target heavy hitting shot, just like Hail of Bullets on the other Grenadier, Salvo, and then Saturation Fire. Now Salvo can be really handy, obviously you want to equip heavy armor on most of your Grenadiers, just because again, they are your explosives specialists. Not to mention, they are also your armor shredding single target damage um, bosses. Now, if you don't watch the other two videos, you'll notice that these, this complement works really well together. You generally want to open with the holo targeting shredder guy, because the cool part about Hail of Bullets is it's a guaranteed hit. So you're guaranteed to shred off some armor and apply holo targeting, making again a hard target, hard target potentially soft. Now let's review some of the loadout, personal combat systems, weapon upgrades I put on each of these guys. So again, I suggest using the heavy armor suits so that you can equip a heavy weapon. Plasma blasters, blaster launchers, any type of you know, flamethrowers, any type of these heavy weapons that you can actually a company with one of these heavy armor suits must be researched at the proving grounds and again what you get since it's an experimental research is random each time um, obviously you want to keep up on top of your other upgrades now once you get proximity mines I strongly suggest equipping at least one of these on each of your grenadiers because for ambushing in concealment it is amazing and even if you have a phantom ability scout, you can still stay outside of visual range of other pods even after you've been revealed, launch one of these to initiate combat, and then walk up to them and watch them destroy themselves. It's a very handy thing to use. Now before you get that, 
EMP grenades are also very good. Obviously, your stock grenades still very useful. At this point in the game, since I'm about mid to late game, I'm rocking proximity mines and then just a plasma grenade. This guy I tend to refer to as my shooter, because he doesn't have salvo and the extra grenade. He's basically more utilitarian than anything. Now, the loadout on this other grenadier is going to be similar. Again, I use a Shredstorm cannon on her instead of the blaster launcher, because she doesn't have some of the other... Um, she doesn't have hail of bullets, basically, and this kind of is a good complement to that. And then I always, whenever possible on these guys, equip an acid bomb. It's just as good as their equivalent in the other tree, but it always applies damage over time and shreds twice as much armor, making it just better overall to have. It's a great opener early on, so if you have a grenadier that's really not high up, but you start to get an acid bomb or, or grenade, and you're just trying to break concealment, you're finding a way to maximize it. And again, if you've seen other videos, you'll notice that basically the overwatch and concealment can be kind of a tricky business because half of them miss, well, then you're kind of toast. You've got three guys that are coming in on you and you've got nothing you can do. So starting off with an acid bomb and then keeping all your other movements preserved means you can still kind of move into other tactically advantageous positions that may even flank the enemy. All right, and as far as personal combat stims and weapon upgrades on these guys, on my opener, since I tend to rush into things, I give him, actually it's over here, the superior conditioning. Now, it would obviously be very handy to have him have some movement speed, but he's kind of just already my tank. He wants to get up there right in their face, unleash a hail of bullets, or even at range. Basically, I'm hoping that he'll be the one that survives, because I always need him in the fight initiating. As far as weapon upgrades, because hail of bullets and, and um, saturation fire takes so much ammo out, you want an extended magazine and an autoloader. These will basically give you free, lo free reloads and a clip size, meaning that you're not in a hairy situation and you have to reload and you lose your opportunity to actually fire with this guy. You want to keep him constantly in the fight. Now as far as our more explosive-oriented Grenadier, I give her speed, right? Because I always want her to be close enough up, and it really complements well with Salvo, meaning that if you don't move at all and you fire a grenade or use a heavy weapon, you're going to get to then fire after that, which again, you'll see if you have speed means you're already in a tactically advantageous position. You don't need to make that extra move to get closer, so then you can take full advantage of salvo. And again, as far as weapon upgrades, chain shot, again, a single target one takes up a lot of ammo, and again, saturation fire does as well. So we use the same upgrades on these, an expended magazine and an autoloader. All right, let's move on to the other guys. And on to the rangers. Now, as I kind of mentioned before briefly, I generally like to run two rangers from the get-go, mostly because I always want a phantom one in the beginning to scout pods out and make sure I know what I'm getting myself into as I'm progressing on the map. Not to mention, on a timed mission, you can really push the envelope with these guys on how fast you can go because you know exactly how each encounter is going to you know, play out. Timed missions are almost necessary. And then a sword one, if you experiment with them, you'll find they are really good at closing the gap and finishing off guys that otherwise would remain up and get a free shot off on you. Now again, your sharpshooter, you'll find in a little bit when we kind of discuss him, can do that too. It's a little bit later in the tree. Whereas a sword ranger, you know, if you put them in tactically positive situations, a faceless, a chrysalid, or a blade elite officer will walk up to you and get swiped to death, essentially giving you free kills anytime one of those melee units comes in contact with her. She can really kind of be like the oh shit, thank you, savior in certain situations. Whereas, of course, your phantom scout is almost critical, especially early on. Now, going over their various specs, again, I kind of go all the way down the left hand side of the tree, except I almost never get deep cover. I find it to be kind of useless considering how I play her. Typically speaking, I'll come out of conceal with one huge heavy hitting rapid fire and then I'll basically use implacable to walk back maybe to high cover or anywhere that's safe and then still probably get targeted since I'm flanking most of these guys and at least the first shot will miss. So this combination gives her some survivability when she comes out of conceal and does an explosive flanking shot. Alright, let's check out the spec on the other guy. So again, on her, almost entirely down the right-hand side of the tree. As I'd also mentioned in the other videos, were I to run one ranger, which I will, once my Psy Soldier gets a little bit higher leveled up, it's going to be this build, with the exception of changing running gun to conceal. Now, the advantages of this are I get to choose when I actually want to conceal and go scout, and if on a mission, for instance, where we all start concealed, 
I get to keep her in the fight after they all get revealed. Whereas, again, with my Phantom Soldier, I tend to be running around scouting even after the rest of my squad is revealed, so she's not really contributing a lot to the fighting itself, meaning I'm down a soldier half the time. Whereas her, I can keep her in the fight 90% of the time, and then I think, oh, it's getting pretty hairy, I'm going to need to conceal, or hey, my squad's kind of low on health, I really need somebody to scout ahead for the next couple of pods. I have the option of doing that with her with this particular build. Not to mention, run and gun is actually kind of not that good anymore. Since you already have Slash, which effectively acts as a run and gun, and you've built her down the sword tree anyways, you're going to be wanting to use that more. And also, Reaper and run and gun are mutually exclusive. Once you activate Reaper, run and gun becomes grayed out. And it makes sense because as you're killing guys with swords, let's say for instance you kill three in a row, but then you want to be in a safe position and shoot the last guy so that you don't put yourself in a vulnerable position, you can do that with Reaper. You don't need run and gun to do that. Now, as far as actual s loadouts on each of these troops, so I always rock Wraith Armor on both of them. Now, in this particular case, I had not made it available for some reason. So that gives you the bonus to dodge and the extra mobility that you need on all of these guys. And then on her, again, because I do um, explosive rapid-fire shots out of conceal, I want to have a guaranteed chance to crit. And this is where talent rounds become incredibly useful. Another 20% puts me over that 100% mark, meaning it's a guaranteed crit on most units that don't already have a natural resistance to crit. So you get the flanking shot, which means like flying units and stuff like that. So if they're a non-flying unit, and you get a flanking shot with talent rounds and shadow step, I'm sorry, Shadow Strike, and then the weapon's natural ability to crit, and a laser sight, again, that puts you over the 100% chance to crit on any soft target. So this kind of segues nicely into our weapon upgrades. Again, I use chance to crit, and because she has rapid fire and increased clip size so that I don't have to reload as often, meaning that if I need to, I can rapid fire in succession multiple times without having to stop. Uh, as far as personal combat stems, again, on both of them, always use speed. As far as the sword one's concerned, you need to be able to close the gap on targets with your sword. As far as she's concerned, she's my scout, so I want her moving as fast to scout as she possibly can, and also being able to run literally behind somebody and flank them very easily and still get a shot off. Again, with her, loadout, always using wraith suits. They are just too good not to use on these guys because you want the speed and on her it actually becomes particularly useful once you get the upgrade from the spider suit to the race suit since you can phase through objects to make sure that you close the gap with reaper activated eventually making you be able to just slice down people and not even have to go around obstacles i use a plated vest on her just because i want a little bit more survivability i was experimenting over here as you can see with the dodge the problem is again she needs the speed she needs to be able to close the gap between her targets with her sword so this plated vest kind of gives her a little bit more survivability in addition to the fact that I will only be having 25 dodge given that I equip the speed PCS. Now as far as weapon upgrades for her, you kind of have a little bit of flexibility here. It doesn't matter as much since you depend upon the sword and the sword isn't affected by weapon upgrades. I'd say, I mean, on her I gave her an increased clip size just because she got hail of bullets. Crit chance I could probably do without and go with, for, you know, superior hair trigger for instance, which I think is probably a really good option. Because that extra chance, let's just say for instance at the end of a reaper run, you realize there's one guy left, but he's too high health for you to finish off, and you want to take a shot from a safe distance. Then you get lucky, and oh, bonus action chance. Now you've hit him with a shot and can walk up and finish him with a sword, completing your Reaper run. That can be a very advantageous um, opportunity right there. Now, these last two characters, I actually spent the most time really, really machinating about exactly how to spec them and how to build them in order to maximize their capabilities and not have to bring two of each on each mission. Now as far as the specialist is concerned, this is kind of a unique way of going about it. Now I was lucky enough to get rapid fire on him, so the rest of the stuff will kind of make a little bit more sense because he can still take down mech units very well without some of the abilities that I didn't spec on him. So as you can see, I spend most of it in the combat hacker tree just because a lot of these skills become absolutely critical later on as you'll find. These guys can get you out of very sticky situations when it comes to, again, maybe a sectopod or advanced mech springs up on from behind you, and you think to yourself, what the heck am I going to do to get out of this? If you get a successful haywire protocol hack to either shut the thing down or control it, that can mean the difference between your entire squad wiping or having a breeze getting through that particular pod. Now, here is where there's some controversy about how I spec him. Now, combat protocol is amazing. It's a guaranteed hit on any unit 
which does almost double damage on mechanical units. The catch-22 is, is that if you don't get medical protocol and you do equip a field or a medicate on it, let's just say you get field medic instead of scanning protocol, then you have to actually walk up next to the unit to heal them. And you can only heal for a maximum of six, whereas with the gremlin, you actually heal a little bit more. I think it's eight max. And so it becomes tactically way more advantageous to have this guy go out. Not to mention, as you saw in the videos before, I had one unit suffering from burning, and it basically essentially took her out of the fight, and I needed to get her back up quickly without moving this guy and putting him in an exposed position. The catch-22 again. If you have a med kit and you have to move to a guy in an uncovered position to heal him or remove a status effect, that guy's probably going to be toast the next turn. So this is why I went with that. All the rest of the ones, scanning protocol, again, you kind of say, well, why don't you just get field medic if you've already got medical protocol? Scanning protocol becomes increasingly more useful, as you'll see, when you encounter chrysalids and faceless. So if you encounter, if you basically pop this guy up, pop a scanning protocol and un leash or reveal faceless and or chrysalids before your, for instance, scout gets flanked by them and revealed by accident, again, it can save you a lot of a headache. Now, the other cool part about scanning protocol is it means that you open up a slot in another unit who might otherwise have to carry a battle scanner, meaning they can use advanced ammo, more grenades, you name it. So it's really a cool thing, and the extra two heals kind of become unnecessary once we get to restoration. As far as these two, threat assessment, as you saw in the video as well I use, is very handy because it automatically puts whoever you apply it to on cover fire overwatch and adding, depending on what level your gremlin is, 20 to 40 defense. Now, Guardian, Ever Vigilant, people say, well, hey, I just moved this guy into position and then want to heal. Well, again, with the way I build him, since he's going to be hacking, healing, and shooting, I'm never going to probably spend an action on anything but just moves. So... I often have him on Overwatch, and you'd be surprised how often this will proc every time he gets a successful hit. It's kind of amazing. I've had him get three in a row, and then only not get the fourth because he ran out of ammo. And then, of course, here at the end, Restoration. Restoration is pretty much one of the most amazing talents in the game, I find. Capacitor Discharge, while very powerful, means that you're really going to only take full advantage of it when you've got, let's say, two mech units that are clumped up. How often that happens? Pretty rare. Now, it does do damage to other units, but it's really meant to just totally take out robotic units. Whereas Restoration, literally your gremlin gets up, flies around, heals, revives, and removes status effects on everybody in your entire squad. So, and the reason I don't just stick with this and then go back to combat protocol is there's those instances where you just want one soldier to get back up, like you saw in some of the videos that I already posted. Restoration is an explosive, hey, everybody got screwed by like four grenades, let's get them all back up. Now, as far as personal combat stems, again, I went. I wanted to keep this guy alive, so I went. Oh, I wanted to keep this guy alive, so I went with more health, basically. Now, I've also done in the beginning on these guys. I typically run the loadout of Advanced Will with the PCS. That basically gives them the opportunity to not get disoriented or taken out of the fight if they, if they get damaged. Since early on, most of your characters will have pretty low will. I found that it to be much more useful. You don't want your healer running around panicked while everybody else is getting shot to death. As far as weapon upgrades, a stock, mostly just because he has rapid fire. Early on, these are amazing. Later on, they kind of fall off. Three damage becomes kind of nothing. But early on, it's kind of amazing. You got a guy with two health left and you have an advanced stock. Well, send that guy on him and you're good. And, of course, a hair trigger, because I want this guy to have his actions open at all times. I'd like for him to shoot every round, of course, but he also needs to heal, to hack, to combat protocol people, and use restoration. So the more actions I get for this guy, the better. Since there's nothing inherently built into the tree, that's why I went this way. And as far as loadout, you can go with the standard tactical armor so that he can have more open slots. Now, as I mentioned before, I do like to make this guy my anti-mech guy, which is why I equipped in one of the slots blue screen rounds. You'll get those guaranteed early on and they are extremely effective. If you get lucky enough to get a specialist like I did with rapid fire, it makes him pretty much one of the most deadly things to mechs on the battlefield next to my grenadiers. And then, of course, your medkit. Always keeping up on top of your gremlins is very important, too. If you can get any research to keep them upgraded, it will increase your hack stat, it will increase the abilities, all the other abilities that you use as well. All right, let's move on to our last unit. 
All right, for our last unit, obviously a sharpshooter, and again, I've kind of uniquely spec'd him to basically try to handle both long-range and short-range things effectively. In XCOM 2, you'll notice that they kind of really force you to push the gambit on keeping everybody pretty close together. Unlike the days when you could just put Archangel armor on, fly a guy up, and then just in the zone shot everybody the entire game, these guys got to kind of keep up. So the way I built him is it's a little bit of both. I think what I take is basically some of the most crucial hard-hitting stuff out of the gunslinger tree, which is an amazing tree, and then a lot of the more applicable stuff that comes out of the sniper tree, so that he can still be effective at long range as well as short range. So for long range, obviously long watch becomes very handy, so that when you are on overwatch after, for instance, saying, hey, we're going to just explore forward, and we want to make sure that we have a shot from far away that's going to actually hit and trigger. Without long watch, your squad sight sniper rifle shots won't trigger. Next, of course, because return fire, while it's a handy skill, you're very seldom actually targeted since you're mostly in the back. Now, I've actually run this guy on the full gunslinger tree, put heavy armor on him, and had him in the front, and he still rarely gets shot. I think that the AI instinctively knows not to shoot a guy with return fire. As far as the next one, Deadeye becomes a kind of hard skill to actually take advantage of. With a minus 25 aim penalty to it, it is so rare I found that I've actually hit these shots, I almost never use it. On the flip side, Lightning Hands gives you a free, action-free pistol shot, which, for obvious reasons, is pretty amazing. The next skill, between Death from Above and Quick Draw, again, Death from Above, it's good, but Quick Draw, it just finds more tactical advantages, as you'll find later. So what I can do, for instance, with Quick Draw and Lightning Hands, is I can get two free pistol shots off without even ending my turn, thus allowing me to, if I had Fanfire, use that, or another pistol shot, or even activate Face Off, which is pretty much one of the most amazing skills, I think, in the entire tree. Now, Kill Zone is very good, too, because you can sit back, create a cone of fire, and not only will they take shots on people who move, but also people who fire. Now, again, this means you're limited by the ammo capacity, in which case, if you do go the kill zone route, I do suggest getting a clip upgrade. Otherwise, face off. Pistols never run out of ammo, so you'll always have this as an available usage as long as it's not on cooldown. It's very handy, the only trade-off, of course, being that you do have to have line of sight and be within range of them. But again, this is just kind of our, hey, we're up close and personal, we really need to take out a lot of people quick kind of um, a couple skills that we have in, this, in the uh, sniper tree. And then, of course, Steady Hands, because, again, I really don't hunker down ever. And this, to me, is kind of a so-so skill anyways, because the first shot only gets 20 aim, and you have to hunker down previously. It means you're potentially wasting a move versus just going on Overwatch. Whereas Steady Hands, plus 10 men, plus 10 crit, always like that. I went with the Serial instead of Fanfire on this build because I, got, I wanted to take advantage of more some of his long-range stuff while still having a good complement of heavy-hitting stuff on the right. And Serial, again, means that if you activate it and then get a kill with your sniper rifle, it basically refunds all of your actions every time. I could, in theory, and I have, killed three guys, walked up, used lightning hands, and then face off on a bunch of guys, effectively making this guy one of the hardest, heaviest hitting units in my entire squad. Now, Fanfire is amazing because it means you can take down single targets very well, and if you were going to do any trade-offs in this particular tree, I'd recommend instead of getting face off, getting kill zone, and instead of Serial, getting Fanfire. That way you kind of have another AOE, you know, you're swapping your AOE skills for more heavy hitting here. It still keeps your options open, although I found this particular build to be very, very handy. As far as loadout, again, I want to keep him mobile. The opportunity to use grapple to put him in a better position, to, for instance, use face-off, or if you actually happen to go cone of fire, to put him in a position where he can activate cone of fire while still preserving all of his moves to do so, it becomes very, very handy, as well as, of course, the dodge. So having two slots doesn't necessarily need me much for him, because he usually only, as a utility item, needs a kind of round that increases his damage and or crit. Talon rounds are good on him. EMP rounds, again, I kind of stick with somebody else. The coolest part about dragon rounds is they get bonus damage for every unit, and for organic units, have a chance to set them aflame. Um, you can do the regular armor, again, early on before you get spider suits and race suits. It's still good and viable, in which case I actually equip battle scanners on them. Since they're kind of in the back and battle scanners can be thrown super far, he becomes another you know, helpful aid in scouting out, especially if you're not rocking a phantom uh, scout. Although you'll see in a second when I actually do do my 
other squad makeup with the ranger with just conceal and the rest of the sword tree and then a size soldier the size soldier ends up getting a battle scanner regardless just because i'm not rocking a phantom ranger um, as far as personal combat stems you generally want to get perception just you never want to hit you never want to miss with this guy and the cool thing about personal combat stems is they affect both your main hand and your pistol whereas your weapon upgrades will only affect your sniper rifle unfortunately so a lot of the pistol skills that you get while awesome do not get boosted by these weapon mods. Now again, I go for increased aim. And then in this particular case, I went for with a repeater. Again, and this is really because I wanted to synergize with serial. I want to make sure that if, okay, I'm shooting a guy, it's a risky shot, there's still a chance that I'll kill him and continue shooting with serial. This allows that. Now again, only 15% chance on the best one means that it still is a dice roll, but it's better having that option than nothing. Alternatively, if you do the cone of fire, again, I recommend it probably instead of the repeater because you're going to want the scope is to get it you know, um, extended clip size. Fortunately, I don't have to because I'm also relying on my pistol a lot with this particular build. All right. All right, and the final unit. Now, this makeup actually right here, though, I didn't feature it in the previous video because I wanted to kind of push a non sci crew since we won't have the access to them until later to its limits. But once you actually do get size soldiers, they are an almost essential complement to your team. Again, you want to kind of level them up a decent amount before you really start bringing them on missions if you have other units that you can use that are better. Because again, it takes about five days per skill to add to their repertoire. You don't need them to get kills in combat. They do not gain XP. They're just trained in the Psy Lab. But once you do get them, again, they're amazing. And typically speaking, this is a loadout that I pop on them. Now, as far as, obviously, armor, you, they're going to be your support. So they're going to act a lot like the specialist in the sense that you want them to be equipped with things that are going to help the rest of your team. Because, again, that's what they do very, very well. So typically I go with the regular medium armor so that you can get two utility slots. And in one of them, I almost always bring Battle Scanner since I'm not going to be bringing my Phantom Ranger. And the other slot's kind of up to you. If you want to make him a little bit more survivable, I'd say between the Stasis Vest, a Hellweave Vest, or a Smoke Bomb, some are, are some of your best options because you really, again, want him to be full support. Now, he already has some other stuff which kind of emulate um, group um, healing effects, which I don't think I have on him yet. I don't. But you can clear other mental effects using him by walking next to other um, units. Now, as far as weapon upgrades, again, I want him to be having as many options to do actions as possible, and if I actually do have him shot, shoot, instead of using one of his very many um, skills, I want it to actually do some damage. Since you're really kind of rarely using his gun, you want to basically say, oh, hey, maybe I'll get a free shot, or hey, what the heck, I'm just going to throw away this action, or ooh, everything's on cooldown, but I need to do some damage on this, or soul fire's on cooldown, I need to do some damage, anything like that. Um, as far as personal combat stims, of course, always will because a lot of his effects will not break through on another character if the will roll does not go through. So all Psy Soldiers, you generally want to have a PCS that increases their will. And again, I don't really have to go over spec. All of these just get unlocked with training. So you don't have to machinate over what to spec. You just keep them in the PSI um, facility, increasing the number of skills they have pretty much at all times. And that's pretty much it. So an elite squad like this will pretty much be able to tackle a lot of the stuff that comes in front of them, as well as having many tactical options as you're progressing through the game. Thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you found this video informative and it gave you enough information to better prepare yourself as you navigate through this awesome game, or maybe overcome any hurdles that you've been encountering along the way. As per usual, if you have any questions or comments you'd like to address me, or if you feel like I missed anything in this video that you'd like me to cover in a future video, please feel free to request it. And the next video planned will likely cover a lot of the other game mechanics, namely how to navigate this map, when to build radio relays, what events to take, what dark events are, how to delay the construction timer in kind of a tactful manner so that you can really extend the game as long as you want to. It does force you to race against time, but I find that if you kind of game these kind of strategies a little bit, you can extend the playthrough play as long as you want. And as per usual, if you liked what you saw, go ahead and like and subscribe. Thanks!